Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Catherine Wall. I'm part of the organizing team. Um, on behalf of the entire committee, we're thrilled to welcome you to Ready to Run, the Blavatnik School's first student-led conference on political campaigning. The school's motto is a world better led, better served, and better governed. We believe that in a democracy, in order to realize this mission, we need passionate and talented people to work to elect those they believe in and to seek office themselves. We've developed a program with that objective in mind, um, <laughs> and we're so excited for the speakers that we've gathered here today. So without further ado, Myungin will kick it off with all the fun stuff, like hashtags and <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, hi, my name is Myungin. I've been doing much of the communications for the conference. Um, we would love for you to engage both offline and online, and especially using hashtag ready to run. And please follow us on Twitter at ready to run 2019 uh, for you to share insights, what your takeaways have been, as well as connect with each other. Um, right now, we'll be playing a short video clip of the interviews that we conducted of the MPP alumni who have successfully ran for elections. I'm Jeremy Roberts, and I'm coming to you live from the capital of Canada, Ottawa. I was part of the MPP class in 2015. My name is Eddie Sombrosen, and I studied a Master in Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government, class of 2016. My name is Gabriel Silva. I am from Panama. I graduated in the MPP in 2015. My name is Felipe Higoni. I'm, I'm an MPP alumni from the 2017-2018 cohort. Being a young person with scarce resources, running as an independent in a constituency where no independent parliamentarian had ever won before, is a tough challenge. As opposed to political parties, as independent, we've got to build our own team to structure our platform, to manage the budget very efficiently, and there's where the MPP helps. It gives you a global vision, it helps you manage time more efficiently, and to make better decisions based on data and evidence. At the end of the day, you'll feel more prepared, more confident to talk about a whole variety of topics. And people like that, people respect that, and you gain support. You know, when asked to consider what I wish I knew uh, before I ran for politics, um, you know, the, the most important lesson that I think I learned throughout all that experience was that integrity really does matter in politics. Uh, that in politics, you're going to get a whole bunch of opportunities to take shortcuts and do little things to try and get you where you need to go quicker. And at the end of the day, you should always follow your moral compass and always remember that if you conduct yourself with integrity, at the end of the line, you'll have that moral high ground. And, and that's what my experience taught me. It does require tremendous effort, time, and teamwork. One of the tips that I can actually give to, to somebody that wants to run is to be physically prepared. You walk a lot, you do a lot of things, you sleep, you sleep really badly during the time. I actually went three times to the hospital because of tiredness during the campaign. The first is, when you're running, you need to be able to answer that most basic question of why are you running. Takeaway number two, you need to have a solid ballot box question. This is the question that you want voters thinking about when they go to cast their vote on election day. Uh, and the last thing is that hard work wins. Uh, that was my campaign slogan in the election. If you're planning to run, uh, make sure your heart's in it fully. Make sure you surround yourself with a team of dedicated people and get out there and do the hard work. Three things that I learned from this campaign. First, be prepared, plan ahead, and don't leave things to the last minute. Second, share with your community. Be with them. You're part of them. And third, make sure to be reachable. Make sure to be in touch with them. Make the difference. Number one is try to understand and read the political landscape before running. Number two is uh, work a lot. It's gonna be a lot of hard work. Get ready to knock on doors, to work more than 16, 17 hours a day. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of work. It's gonna be very hard at the beginning and in the middle, but suddenly uh, 
things just go go well by the end. Uh, people, when the, when the elections, they come close, more and more people will start to, 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 to follow you and help you out. So just try to endure the first uh, weeks and months. And number three, um, try to identify what other candidates won't do and do those things. I would say, first of all, run. That's really hard. It seems simple, but it's really hard. You have to be really convinced that you're going to run and that you can actually win. Second of all, uh, you need to understand your comparative advantage, I would say. So what is the one characteristics or the two characteristics that makes you different from the other candidates? Third is your team. Not, not only the team of volunteers that you build, but your actual actual team of the campaign. I had 28 people hired to, to work in the campaign, and these were all people that really knew me, they really wanted to make me win, and they were really in love with the fact that, that we can, could, could actually win. And this actually made a, a lot of difference because these people made me be where I am right now. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce a leader for whom many of us need no introduction. Dean Nairi Woods is the founding dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. A strong advocate and public intellectual on global governance, it is her vision that has been embodied in this school we know and love. Dean Woods was especially supportive of our efforts to host today's Ready to Run campaign conference from the beginning when it was all just an idea. And just last week, we were so grateful when she gave our team an amazing crash course on moderating panels. It's not every day you get to get moderating tips from a woman who regularly interviews heads of state as part of her job, but that's what Nairi did for us. So we thank you for that and all the support you've given not only to this conference, but also to the student body as we embark on our final days at the Blavatnik School of Government. It is because of Dean Woods and the mission of this school that we continue on a course to a world better led, better served, and better governed. We hope that today's conference will open a dialogue on electing good representation and running political campaigns with integrity to further that goal. Now join me in welcoming and thanking Dean Woods. Thank you, Erica, and thank you, all the um, students that have been part of making this possible. I've, for such a long time, I've wanted um, uh, to see some more work and workshopping around how to campaign. The lesson I took from the four MPPs, the MPPs in the room are going to love, because it's that we should probably quadruple the workload in the MPP, so that you're used to working 18 hours a day before you go and run your campaign. But um, maybe not. I'm not getting an enthusiastic <laughs> vibe back from that particular message. Um, I think the, the thing I wanted to say um, as you all engage in starting to prepare your political campaigns today, I hope that's what you're going to do, is that you're doing it in a world that really is at an extraordinary pivot point. And the one piece of evidence that I would put in front of you is the evidence that responds to the question, how many households in your country have seen their household revenue from income and capital stagnate or decline since 2005? That's the critical question. In other words, how many people have a stake in the system? How many people are going to want to support an existing you know, um, mainstream political party because they believe that it's likely to deliver something to them? Now, the figures that the McKinsey Global Institute calculated on this tell us that in France, that number, the number of people who are disaffected, the number of people whose household revenue has stagnated or declined in France since 2005 is 63%. The number for Britain is 70%. The number for the Netherlands is 70%. The number for the United States is 81%. The number for Italy is 97%. 
percent. So you're going to be running now. You could go on around the world, right? These figures look scarily similar across a lot of countries in the world. So you could, you know, um, I think the number one thing that you've got to do as future politicians is ask yourselves why, but also to ask yourselves what is it that that 80% or 70% or 63% have as their number one concern. And if you, if you, if you don't do that, you shouldn't run for politics. Um, the, very often, if I quote those figures, the first thing people say to me is, but it's technology and globalization. It's not stuff that politicians can do anything about. Wrong. Why is that wrong? Because not all countries have a majority of people losing out from the system. If you take the number for Sweden, it's only 20% over that same time period. Now, I'm not saying all countries should look like Sweden. What I'm saying is that this result of the last decade and a half, whereby most households in most of our countries, households where people are working harder and harder, but they're watching their revenue go down, that that result is not an, in an inevitable result. It's the result of public policies. It's a result of the things that you will do as a politician. And it's a result of what politicians have been doing in all of those countries for the last decade and a half. And I don't say that to rant. I say that because that's what the evidence tells you. If one European successful country has only seen 20% of households decline and another has seen 70%, the difference lies in the, in the policy framework. So I just want to throw that in as a starter for one to all of you who are about to run for politics and say, as I'm sure you'll hear today, that First, it's about understanding what it is that the people that you represent and the people that you want to serve are most um, affected by. And, and, and from then on out, it's about uh, tactics and campaigns. We already started debating outside whether it's all about WhatsApp or not. That'll be the subject of your discussion today. Can I finish by saying, if in doubt, go for it. Um, now is the time in your life when you've got the least to lose and therefore the most that you can put into a political campaign. I used to say to people, wait till you've got experience, wait till you've learned how to run things, wait till you've got a set of professional skills. But the problem is that by the time you've got all of that, you've got too much to lose by running a political campaign. So now I say, just go for it. And today, start learning about how to do it and who to go for advice on how to do it. So good luck to all of you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Abela. I'm a Master of Public Policy uh, candidate here at the Blavatnik School of Government. And I'm also a member of the organizing committee um, of this conference. And I'm here today to moderate our first panel of the day, uh, which is um, aptly titled Capturing Hearts and Minds. And we're going to be talking about um, the role that communication plays in a successful political campaign. I have a fantastic lineup of speakers with me here today. Um, so to my left, um, I have Sean Roberts, who has been the Director of Campaigns and Elections at the Liberal Democrat Party here in the UK since June 2016, where he leads advocacy campaigns, election and field operations, and polling and research. Prior to that, he worked at WITCH, the UK Consumers Association, where he ran consumer campaigns, and he built a movement of 750,000 supporters. He also served in a number of um, other campaign-related positions in the Liberal Democrat Party from 2002 to 2011. So he has really seen how communication strategy has evolved uh, over the past years. And indeed, he has over 30 years of experience uh, fighting and leading campaigns both in the UK and abroad. Um, in the middle, we have um, Isabella Sharp. Isabella is the Deputy Managing Director for the Political Communications Consultancy firm, the White House Consultancy, 
where she specializes in developing cross-disciplinary communications campaigns, primarily for health, environmental and media organizations. However, she started um, her career in politics. She started working um, as a researcher for a member of parliament and in the Conservative Party press office over the 2015 and 2010 elections. So she combines both private sector experience and experience within a political party. And um, before embarking on a career in, um, and after that, um, she embarked on a career in corporate communications and she developed her expertise in international crisis and issues mitigation in both politics and media. So I'll, I'm particularly looking forward to hearing your tips on how to manage a crisis. Um, and uh, finally, um, our last speaker is Kate Guy. Kate Guy served as assistant to the campaign manager in uh, Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. Uh, she is currently uh, a doctoral student here in Oxford, uh, where she studies the intersection of climate change, global governance, and national security. Aside from her studies, she is research assistant uh, to none other than the dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, Nairi Woods. She is a manager of the Oxford School of Climate Change and a research fellow within the Center for Climate and Security. Um, she has most recently worked in American politics and policy as the senior policy program manager with the Truman National Security Project. So I'm sure we can all agree that we have a lot to learn from the panel uh, we have here today. Um, so in terms of procedure, what I plan to do is ask our panelists a few questions that I've prepared, but I already want you to start thinking about what you'd like to know from them because I would very much like you to engage and ask your own questions. We have Antonio here and where is Alina? who are um, here with mics, so please signal to them as soon as you have um, a question, and we'll take that. Um, so my first question is for Sean. You've had a pretty good month, I'd say. So in the recent European Parliament elections, the Liberal Democrats placed second overall, obtaining more than 20% of the votes cast and electing 15 MEPs. So tell us, what elements of your communication strategy were most vital in securing this result? Well, um, let's just say, I, I accepted this invitation before that happened as well, so I was kind of quite bold in that respect. Um, and uh, so, you know, working in politics, uh, just say, is, is enormous fun. It's a privilege, and it has been a completely thrilling time to work within politics, although to a certain extent, you know, um, some of the stuff that, I, you know, I started three days before the referendum uh, in this country in my current job. So, you know, it's, it's been a few years to sort of, you know, to sort of go with that. But, um, you know, our success, our very recent success has, you know, the, the roots of that actually go back at, at least two years. Because you know, when a party had been through what the Liberal Democrats had been through in 20, the 2015 election, which is pretty much near wipeout, you have to build it back up again for, for nothing. And you don't necessarily have to build it up the way it was before. And what we identified through that period, particularly around, after the referendum in the UK, is that there is, without doubt, a big market or vote there for a Liberal Party in the UK that right now you know, the voters out there, liberal-minded voters out there, don't really have a home in the way that the Conservative Party and Labour Party has changed. And us, as a Liberal Party, ought to be their voice. Um, you know, in the past, I think you can look back in the fairly near recent history, I think Liberal voters could look at someone like David Cameron and say, you know, he stands up for me, or even Tony Blair before that, for, until the war in Iraq. But right now, Liberal voters do not have a voice. So we identified this, this group, we've done lots of research, we can target them. We've been talking to them, we've been campaigning with them with our Brexit campaign over two years. Um, not a lot happened through that period. You know, we sort of still bumped along. When we had a, an election campaign where we could actually put a lot of effort in on the ground in, a, in an area, we saw some very, very strong results. But nationally, there was no breakthrough. And the reason for that, above all else, is just credibility. You know, it's not enough being right. It, you know, if people aren't going to, you know, if people aren't listening to you, you know, it kind of kills me these days that someone like Nick Clegg or Tony Blair goes on TV and says usually really, really sensible stuff, but no one listens to them anymore because of what's gone in their history. And as far as the Liberal Democrats are concerned, when we were seen as unimportant as not doing well, no one listened to us. And what we really set out to do this year is keep with that audience, target, get that message even tighter, but we use the local elections um, to kind of separate ourselves from you know, what were our challenges at that point. You know, three months ago, the Liberal Democrats, Change UK and the Green Party were kind of neck and neck in the opinion polls. 
we use the local election results to really boost our credibility and our local election campaign. So we put a huge amount of effort into getting that election result. And so, you know, just to see the words, the Liberal Democrats win 700 seats, you know, Liberal Democrats back from the dead, and all that kind of stuff. And the moment that happened, you know, we pivoted onto our European campaign. But the thing we were waiting for in the days after that local election result was, yes, we got the great headlines, was that first opinion poll that kind of just showed us bumping up and separating ourselves from that kind of, you know, uh, that group uh, of other parties. And as soon as that came through, it started to feed on. And at that point, we, we, it gave us that opportunity to really get out there with that, that liberal message that we've been banging on about for the last two years. Obviously, we sharpened it up a little bit. Those of you who followed the campaign would have heard a phrase, bollocks to Brexit. Um, that got amazing cut through. And it, again, it sort of showed that kind of outsider, that kind of challenging the, the establishment type way. And our entire campaign just kind of like lifted up as that credibility built up. But really, that all goes back to that message that we've been running, that audience that we've found and targeted for like two long years without a huge amount of success. But now that has really built on to what we're seeing now, which is kind of 20% in the opinion polls. Um, we are in amongst what's going on in British politics again, which is really exciting. It's probably fragile at the moment. That we're working with, we haven't really scratched the surface of it yet. It is far, far bigger. And... Sure. So we've just heard about um, a political campaign that uh, was uh, quite successful, but in many cases, um, political campaigns encounter uh, difficulties. Um, they encounter political uh, scandals about particular candidates. Um, so we're fortunate to have Isabella here, who is a specialist in crisis communications. And I think what we all want to know from her is what do you do? What are the first three things you need to do as a campaign manager? Uh, when faced with a political crisis or a scandal. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, firstly, I have to say that a tiny, dark part of me loves a crisis. <laughs> There's nothing like having that adrenaline pumping through your bones and knowing that so much rests on the decision you're going to make in the next five seconds. Um, it's really thrilling being part of the centre. But, of course, there's so much at stake and things can go wrong. And what I'd say in this day and age... Um, Alistair Campbell used to say you have one hour to kill a story. But with social media being as it is and so many people using it and being confident using it, um, you have more like 10 minutes these days. So the most important thing is you have to react quickly because if you don't react quickly, thousands of people will come in there and fill the void with their own conjectures, their own views, and then you're railing back on that and you haven't even got the chance to start setting the narrative. So it's a more crowded space. First thing I'd say is get a quick statement out there. Now, you don't always know what the issue is. If it's something to do with uh, your candidate, some potential scandal, you might not have all the information about it. If that you're a large organisation and um, an incident is unfolding, you won't really know what's going on, but you have to say something. So you say what you know, you promise you're going to come back with more and you give a deadline to do that. So whether that deadline's in two hours, whether it's the next day, um, you, you just demonstrate that you're, you, you care partly, and you also demonstrate that you're setting the agenda. Um, you need to be confident. So where you can deny a story, don't beat around the bush. You go out there and you deny it. Where you need to apologise, you go out there and you apologise. It's very, very important that you do that. A lot of, from an organisational perspective, um, there's been a lot of cases where firms have not apologised because they're scared of the legal um, repercussions. But actually, history has demonstrated that the legal repercussions can be far less damaging than the, um, than the communications and reputational repercussions of not saying sorry. So, second thing to do is, in order to make that quick statement, you need a quick sign-off process. And this comes down to internal communications within your team and how you structure yourself as a functioning organisation from a comms perspective. So this can mean one of two things. Either the social media manager decides what the message is going to be and they make the decision to press the button, or the decision maker is the social media manager and they're pressing the button. What you don't want is the social media manager um, sat outside the closed boardroom where the CEO is arguing with the board member or the candidate's arguing with someone else in his team and they're prevaricating for hours over what to say because invariably the story will have moved on and also where you spend hours thinking about the message is bound to be more complex and less clear and that's not necessarily always a good thing. So thirdly I think social media is a good thing in a, in a crisis because you can use it to oversee what people are saying about the story and you can adapt your message to, to accommodate what the story is, and that helps you retain control of the narrative. Um, so I think it's a really good thing. But what I'd say mainly about a crisis 
um, situation is you must always be prepared. But it's impossible to be prepared because you don't know what the crisis is going to be. But you must prepare nonetheless. Thank you, uh, Isabella. So I think now we're, we have uh, a better idea of how to uh, prepare for a crisis. Uh, what really struck me was that you said that uh, um, in a political campaign, you nowadays have 10 minutes to react. Absolutely. And this, I think, brings me uh, very nicely to my question for Kate. Um, so um, what I'd love to hear from you, Kate, is um, a story about um, a time on the campaign trail uh, with Hillary Clinton where you had to... Uh, where an event beyond your control meant that you had to very quickly change your communications priorities for the day and how you went about that. Sure, which one do you want to choose from? <laughs> <laughs> so many. Um, no, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Catherine, and all the students uh, for putting this on. As I have personal experience in what a labor it is to do something like this, especially during uh, end of term time. So congrats to you and BSG staff. Um, also, as Anna says, I am a recovering campaign staffer turned PhD student. So maybe don't take my thing, what I have to say, too seriously, unless you want to end back up in academia like I did. But um, it's, a, it's a fun but less exciting place. Um, all right, to answer the question, let's see. I think I want to take you back to one day that's particularly memorable for me, which is the 22nd of July in 2016. So maybe think back where, where you were in that, that hot and fun summer of 2016. So the setting is uh, campaign headquarters, which was in Brooklyn, New York. So if you've never been to an HQ of a campaign, picture um, like the dingy set of the office meets your college dorm room um, in terms of unshowered, not having slept, young staffers running around fighting over printers and things. Um, but we were particularly buzzing on that day because it was the, the eve of the Democratic National Convention, which started the next uh, Monday. And the, the convention is where we were set to nominate Hillary Clinton um, as the presidential nominee for the Democratic Party and make history in doing that. So we were so, so just excited about all of what was to come. And so as the assistant to the campaign manager, which basically meant I was the staffer to the CEO of the campaign, who's kind of overseeing all strategy and campaign operations, I had a number of communication strategies on my mind that day. Um, first of all, the big kind of comms team priority uh, was that was the day that we were announcing our running mate, our vice presidential nominee to the country, to the world. Um, and that was Tim Kaine. And so we had a very careful uh, rollout uh, plan in place for that because as, as we heard, you need to shape that narrative from the first. And this was really our chance to introduce the running mate to the country. So that was a, a really carefully structured process of how to do that. Um, the second priority in my head was a bit less public. Um, it was something we were, really, we were really focused on internally, and that was the coming convention, all of the plans that were laid for that. Um, and from my perspective, we had been in a few months at that point of negotiations with Senator Sanders' campaign um, about how the two kind of wings of the party would come together in this moment, about how he would be the one nominating Secretary Clinton at the convention. And uh, Senator Sanders is a tough bargainer. So he had, we had gone back and forth in negotiations um, for, for weeks at that point around the minutia of the party platform, around um, you know, the choreography of that moment. And we were finally set and ready to agree to a deal um, about what that would all look like when we arrived in Philadelphia uh, the next day. That's, those two priorities were there in the midst of taking calls from the minority leader of the Senate, of trying to figure out what was the cheapest train to get us down to Philadelphia, and all of these things that you're, you're dealing with in any given day in a campaign. And then I looked at Twitter, and I saw a tweet from WikiLeaks um, announcing a treasure trove, I think as they called it, of thousands and thousands of emails um, hacked from the DNC, so the party, the Democratic National committee um, up online. And it was truly, I think, the tweet heard around the world. Around the world. Immediately, all the phones um, were ringing off the hook, reporters calling for comments on this. Um, we ourselves, you know, you could see as popcorn kind of across HQ as people found out about this and quickly, you know, went online to try to figure out what was going on. Um, and it was just one of those moments um, of crisis, of panic. And so how do you communicate in a moment like that? Well, there were a number of things that kind of happened all at once. So the first question was, what are we even looking at? You know, are these real? Are these fake? Are these mostly real with a couple of fake things thrown in there? What is this? And we were ourselves as a campaign trying to digest that in the moment as we had press calling us for a statement on it and knowing that we needed to figure that out really quickly, figure out what we had to say about it. Uh, but we were looking at it fresh as everybody else. We had no prior warning of this. 
Um, what we quickly came to realize as soon as we looked at that um, was that there was a, because it was just kind of an uncensored trove, you know, stash of emails, there was a lot of really sensitive information in there. So think our donors, donors that had been back and forth in communication, their bank accounts, their addresses, their names, same with staff, staff that had been hired, their social security numbers, their personal information was all up online. And that was a communication that fell to us to alert them that you know there was potential exposure there. Um, and that's not something that was press focused, but a really important communication to get right and get quick um, very quickly. Um, in that same vein, so we got all the, the tech and digital team together to help us figure out what we were looking at. And all of a sudden, I remember um, one tech staffer ran up to us and said, stop. We need to get everybody off WikiLeaks now. And we were like, why? And it was because this tech staffer had realized that WikiLeaks, being the kind of nefarious actor we now know they are, was from their side tracking every person that went on their website, everything they were searching, geo-targeting for, hmm, I wonder what the Hillary Clinton campaign headquarters is searching for, what names, what issues are they worried about being in this treasure trove of emails? And we were very worried that very quickly that would be made public and that would be a whole new story. So we had to quickly within uh, staff communicate you know, shut it down, nobody go on WikiLeaks, this is being monitored, and shut that down. But again, another form of communication that we hadn't even foreseen in the moment. Um, that kind of also goes to the uh, personal element here that I was talking about before, of just how are we going to handle this? Um, all of our carefully planned communications priorities for the day were now scuttled in this moment, and how do we go forward from that? From the uh, carefully planned rollout of our, our running mate to this convention uh, plans laid going ahead. Obviously, you can imagine that the Sanders campaign thought they had a, a very different um, bargaining hand now once, once these kind of things were out there in public. So how did we move forward? Um, there are many, we can talk about many things in there um, that just kind of gives you a couple lessons of things you need to think about really quickly. But I think there are a few other lessons that I drew from it, just with the perspective of hindsight, um, that are important for any situation like this. Um, the first is you need to let go of control, particularly when you are working at the peak, this crazy kind of unsteady pinnacle um, of particularly presidential politics, but any politics, um, you are not going to be in charge of the communications narrative, of the, the sphere. It's going to come at you, and you're going to have to deal with it. And I think that's very hard for, for type A people that generally run campaigns to, to realize, but you've got to let go of that control. And the way that you can still make yourself feel OK is, is like Isabel said, is try to plan for every crisis. Now, how would we have possibly planned for something like this? It was actually possible. So I don't know if people remember, but in June of 2016, there were a couple smaller leaks. Um, there was an advanced staffer that had been hacked. Um, there was somebody, an uh, individual close to Secretary Clinton um, that had been hacked, and all of their emails were put up online. And we were kind of dealing with that in a similar way. But if at that moment we'd kind of been like, oh, this might be something that happens at an even bigger scale. What is our protocol there? What do we do? That would have been a way to kind of foresee crises. So it's even the small things that you're dealing with, think about how those can become bigger and, and more public and put a plan in around that. Um, my second lesson of the three are really what I think was the most painful part of this entire process. Um, and it stems from understanding and learning the lesson now that your personal communications are not personal. So the hardest part was to see your friends on the campaign be publicly embarrassed for some you know, inner office gossip email that they sent when they were annoyed. And for the little snark that goes back and forth in a G chat or in a little message that just happens to be online. And then that was on the front page of the New York Times. And I am so glad I learned that lesson at that time. I'm so glad that I per myself didn't fall into that. My emails were, were later in the Podesta hack. Um, but I think that is something to learn right now, that do not send anything that you wouldn't be totally happy being out there for all the world to see and just hold yourself to that um, because 
there is a very good chance it will be if you're working at this level of politics. Um, that goes for kind of campaign cybersecurity in general. So my boss, the campaign manager, Robbie Mook, went from 2016 to start a project um, with Harvard actually working at, okay, what are the actual specific cybersecurity needs of campaigns? And I encourage if you're running for office to go look at, at that site um, because there is a specific kind of personal hygiene that is different about a campaign in terms of cybersecurity. Um, and it's something that you really need to imbue in your staff from the beginning. Otherwise, you are very susceptible and very vulnerable to all the people that want access to the information. Um, and then my last lesson really, and this is something I, I don't think I've, I've figured out yet. I don't know if anybody has, but I think the hardest part of, of communicating after this hack was that we were actually in the process and in the weird position of having to communicate something that was unbelievable to people. So because of the two hacks that had happened before and because um, just you know, the nature of what it was, we were told pretty quickly after this was all up online by um, security experts that there were, there were things that made them think that Russia was behind this. Um, so again, this was all the way back in, in June and July. And that there were just signals and markers, which we have come to find out was definitely the case, um, of Russia. And so we were in the weird position of, do we say that or not? Do people, are people in a place to actually be able to understand that and believe that? And I think what we found out um, was that they were not. People, people, that was completely unimaginable to people that um, some kind of foreign, <laughs> foreign actor would be able to intervene in an election in that way. Um, and so I think that's a, it's a hard thing to figure out what your strategy is around, um, you know, getting the press to believe you, getting the public to believe you when it's something so unimaginable like that. And I would love to, to discuss that further with people. Um, so, so those are kind of my, my lessons from that moment. I think they all, they all came together in the end when a, an hour or two later, I was white knuckled driving a Toyota Prius um, across the Brooklyn Bridge uh, in heavy Friday afternoon traffic to get down to Philly because we quickly realized we had to deal with this crisis on the ground as fast as possible. Um, and we needed to be in a car, not on a train where everyone could overhear our conversation. So it was me in the car um, with my campaign manager and our chief legal counsel rapidly trying to respond to all these things. I was like sending emails to the staff about, oh, here's the campaign running it, made announcement, FYI, and these things. Um, so I guess there's also an element here of don't forget the personal in it. You are all humans. Everybody in this situation is humans. and. You got to realize that, um, but I'll stop there, and we can we can get into more details if people are interested. I'm sure I'm sure they will be, and I'm looking <laughs> forward uh, to their questions. Um, thank you so much, Kate, because you've just shared possibly one of the most high octane moments um, of the one of many uh, high octane moments in Hillary Clinton's uh, presidential campaign. Um, but of course, one of the more mundane duties of a campaign manager, and this is a question for you, Sean, is to translate complex uh, public policy into snappy sound bites that the average voter can grasp um, in a few seconds. Uh, so could you tell us a bit about um, your tips for doing this? And something I'm personally curious about is whether there's ever conflict between the policy monks who draft the policy and the communication specialists who reduce that to a three-word slogan. <laughs> Frequently <laughs> is the answer to that. And um, so, I mean, this is like a, a lifelong kind of like struggle that goes on. You know, what wins elections? Is it policy or is it message? Um, um, it's message, um, it's emotion. But actually, without the policy that backs it up, it's a, it's a little bit meaningless and it's a little bit empty. And if you're going to if you're going to win, you need to know what you're going to do once you are elected. Um, so I think one of the things that sort of I've done in this role um, since I, I've been here is actually work much more closely with the policy people. It used to be that uh, to, to a degree, obviously it's like, you know, slight stereotype in this, but we'll get near an election. We'll say, OK, what's going to go in the manifesto? suddenly look at all the policy that have been coming in and we pay no attention to whatsoever and then go, well, what's this? This isn't right. This isn't any good. Um, and weirdly, the policy people didn't enjoy that very much, didn't make a very good relationship and actually was no way of doing things. So what we do now is that we work with the policy people from a very, very early stage. We share the results of the research. So, you know, I mentioned like the value of uh, understanding your audience, your target market, um, you know, 
if we give the people that are making our policy the information about that at the very, very beginning, then they will make better policy because of it. Um, at least that's, how, that, that's what we seem to be discovering so far. But when you're kind of like not giving them that target group to think about, they, you know, you can't really expect them always to just know that and get it right. Um, and that pr approach is, is really kind of like, I think, helping us a lot um, when you come through to it. You know, I have got a, a very good communications director who is the soundbite expert. You know, it's not it's not the same for everyone. I think that there's a real kind of like uh, uh, you need a mix of people to understand this. Uh, what I do really well is get messages into a really sort of snappy way, s shape, uh, and I can tell a really good story. I can do a really good strategy, but actually. The, you know, the skill of getting that sort of those three words that just sum thing, things up actually uh, you, very often it's a different kind of person and you, when you can find someone like that because they're, they're actually quite rare mm -hmm. with that absolute gift for kind of coming up with that you know Frank Luntz in the States for over many years with always you know the death tax and you know I mean on the wrong side of things from my point of view <laughs> but, on your, but you know there is an expert to this and that is a very valuable post to have but so much of this really comes back to is can you get like direct the policy process from the beginning so you actually show who the target audience is and at the end of it you have to be kind of quite honest with this is that you know a manifesto or you know a party platform an election campaign you know um, you know the best you're going to put forward in an election campaign is two or three things sometimes just one if, if it's being really really effective you know the campaign we just did uh, about brexit there was one me about the european elections there was one message and it was stop brexit you know the, the details underneath it were all there but you know we had a whole ream of other policy that was just kind of there sitting in the manifesto but i think again where we've been really honest and you've built that relationship with the policy people you know, they sort of say you know the value you add you know is yes you give us the, the one or two bits we use in the election but after the election that's when you know the elected representatives are going to take your work and really make a difference to it so i think for me it's the teamwork aspect of that is, is oh so important and you know as i say in a lot of organizations policy has been over there and campaigns have been over there and that's a really not a good place to be that's uh, that's yeah. fascinating um so um i think one of the big changes we've seen um in uh in political campaigning in the past few years has been the increasing role that social media has played um, in political campaigns. Um, so I'm keen to hear from Isabella on um, how effective you actually think um, social media is in a political campaigning context. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about um, lobbying campaigns because um, that's where, more where my experience lies. I, I think Sean can probably talk um, more effectively about um, social media when running a political campaign. But from a, from a lobbying perspective, social media has changed it massively. It's so much easier to reach politicians and get direct through to their phones, through Twitter, through their emails. Um, it's easier to galvanise people through social media networks to act quickly. And all they have to do is they have to press a button, they have to paste a message, and off it goes to their MP. So there's far more um, lobbying, mass lobbying going on at the moment. And it's really interesting to see. It's been growing for about the last 10 years, I'd say. And in theory, it's a very democratic medium because any individual can start a campaign and lobby the government on an issue. Um, however, what we have seen are bigger organisations like 38 Degrees, I'm sure you've heard of them, who are really mobilised to, um, to push campaigns forwards and they're all about getting as many people signing petitions as, as possible and hopefully, well their aim is to bombard someone's inbox or someone's Twitter feed with thousands and thousands of people saying the same message so that the person, the politician is forced to act because they, in theory, don't can't get on with their everyday work because they've just got all these messages coming in. And I think they've had, since they began, about 39 million um, ac digital actions happen on their website. Similarly, we've seen the government respond to this with the establishment of um, their petition site. So in the first year, this site saw um, 6.4 million um, signatories. Earlier this year, there was the Revoke Article 50 petition, which in five days saw 5.5 million people sign it. Um, and these petitions have been adapted very um, adopted very quickly by people and being pushed out social media. So there was a time um, a year or so ago where I couldn't open Facebook without being confronted with a number of petitions which my friends had signed. I don't really open Facebook anymore for those reasons, but, um, well, I do. But, um, but, but it's, it's, it's slightly changed even since then. What I, what I would say with regards to these campaigns is it's a, it needs to be a very simplistic message. That's because nowadays um, you have three seconds to grab someone's attention on, on social media, and that's kind of gone down from seven seconds, I think, in the last year or so. You probably know more about this than I do. Um, and also with a, with a mass um, lobbying campaign, you're pushing out one message to a really large and varied demographic, so invariably it has to be a simple one. So it's, 
politicians are savvy to this. And if they're receiving a number of these mass uh, lobbying petitions every day, they can tune them out, and that's a real downside. And um, what we will see is where those government petitions do get the right number of signatures and do get parliamentary time. So if in the example of the revoke Article 50 petition, it was uh, bunched in with a number of other petitions in the milieu of the Brexit debates a few months ago. They don't actually necessarily lead to any um, impactful action on the, on, by the government or by parliament. That, uh, that petition actually kind of sung without a trace after its brief flare of glory. So th there's an element of scepticism around this. But that's not the end of the story. What we're finding is these organisations like 28 Degrees are using the same tech that's been used on political election campaigns to target very, very niche demographics using information mined through Facebook um, to push out nuanced messages. So what they're doing now is campaigns are having a more textured feel, a more individualistic feel, so it doesn't feel like a mass homogenous campaign, and that comes across as much more realistic. What we're also seeing is um, organisations um, innovating through their own platforms in order to um, push out targeted lobbying campaigns. And we saw Uber did this in um, New York a couple of years ago when the mayor was um, looking to um, cap the number of licensed Uber's drivers. They just installed a button on their driver's app for the driver to, to press and they could then directly lobby the mayor. So overall, yes, social media is a very, very powerful medium for lobbying. Um, it's now kind of incorporated in every, every lobbying or political communications campaign has me social media as a matter of course, whether that's um, images, videos are very, very powerful and, and very, very simplistic stats, that's standard. What is interesting to me is where Twitter has moved, where it used to be a mass uh, kind of um, targeted um, platform, it's now become very niche, but it's still so, so relevant in the Westminster bubble. So where a lobbyist or a campaign um, can get into that Westminster bubble conversation, um, you can have resonance and you can be heard. But that's a very, very particular um, avenue that that platform has taken, I think. That's really fascinating, and I do, as a, as a Twitter user myself, I do sometimes feel that, uh, that it's very easy to create an echo chamber on social mm, media. Really. And I do really think, particularly in this country, following uh, politics in this country as, as a student here, um, I really feel like it's a very small group of people who are talking to each other about the key issues of the day. So it's, it's really interesting. Absolutely. To but if it's the right group, mm. then you should still be participating in that. That's interesting. That's good to know. Um, so one last question from me before I open the floor for a first round of questions. So please do start thinking uh, what you'd like to ask uh, our panelists. Uh, so my last question is for Kate. Um, one of the difficult um, elements of campaigning that a campaign operative has to, uh, to prepare for is the possibility of defeat. Um, so what I'd like to hear from you is how do you prepare a communication strategy to manage defeat? It's a tough question. <laughs> well, first you win, and then you have to deal with it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm, there's so much to say about defeat at so many levels. Um, I think we're all still dealing with it and processing it through all of our various countries and issues we care about. Um, but the thing that really sticks with me in the aftermath is that it's just so hard to plan for something that's really painful and that's something that you don't want to happen. And so you don't. You know, you, you avoid it or you say, oh, there is a chance and you, you I mean, this is decision-making psychology, right? You look for the data that supports what you want to happen. You kind of, you, you are optimistically biased about what will happen and then you kind of leave that um, to the side. And I get it, it it's, it's, there's cognitive dis dissonance around us actually doing that. Um, but you have to, and you have to do it on a number of, di of dimensions. Obviously, I mean, the one everybody always knows is you have to, you know, for the candidate, prepare a win speech and a concession speech. Like, that's, that's easy and that's obvious. Um, but from a, a managerial perspective or from, you know, a, a campaign perspective, there are many things you need to think about in that reality. Um, you need to think about how you take care of your staff, how you deal with their emotional pain in the aftermath, because they're all very young and just worked 18-hour days, seven days a week, four months to, to get to that point. Um, but also, like in, in the States, uh, we needed to ensure that uh, those people had health care through the end of the year before they got the next job, unemployment insurance, these kind of things that are just actually really important for the, the humanity of working on a campaign. Um, you need to, yes, plan the communication strategy in, in all levels. So if, even if you lost, how do you, you know, spin that into some kind of win? 
Um, this is a, a especially important for the primary campaigns that you're seeing at the presidential level in the states right now. A lot of those people, almost all of them, are going to lose. How are they going to spin that um, so it's still good for them personally in their careers uh, will be really interesting to see. Um, you need to plan, included in that legal or in that communication side is a legal strategy. So um, this is something that, that is really important. If it's close enough, what are you going to do? Are you going to challenge that in court? Are you, um, you know, were there legal um, things around the vote or something like that? You need, you need to have plans and you need to have experts planning those plans um, for how are you going to handle that. And that's something that we, we definitely. Um, had uh, a lot of. And then next, I think you, you just need to figure out how you communicate, um, other than the spin, just what happened. Uh, because at the, at the end of a campaign, especially one that's lost, it becomes this, this crazy, you know, what happened, who didn't listen to who, this kind of viper's nest of, of blame and, and weirdness, where I found in the aftermath of the campaign, everyone just kind of blamed who they already didn't trust. <laughs> So if they if they didn't like the party, they blame the party. If they didn't like um, Senator Sanders, they blame Sanders. If they didn't like her, they blame her. And it was just you know pretty typical in that way. Um, so you need to figure out how you're going to work together and and collaborate and and not cause more pain than you need to um, by having a, a good message there. Um, yeah, and then I guess just obviously defeat is also a very personal thing. And I think the hardest thing for me was, uh, you know, my future, but also looking around at these people that you really form a family with. You're just working, you're seeing them a lot more than you're seeing your actual family. So you are bonding with them and seeing their pain and dealing with their pain. Um, and I think it's just something to, to process. I'm really glad for myself that it happened to me quite young in my career. So I know how to come back for something like that. I know how to figure out what my next steps are. Um, what I care about, um, and yeah, it's it's not fun, but try to try to put on the hat even for a couple minutes, figure out what the plan is, and then take it off and be optimistic again. <laughs> That's a really uh, really interesting uh, insight. Um, I can imagine it's it's as you said a difficult thing to do, but an absolutely necessary uh, part of your campaign. Sean, yeah, just, I mean, uh, I've lost a few election campaigns <laughs> through the years, um, and sometimes they've been the best campaigns I've done. The moment I always think, as a campaign manager, is when the polls close, before they count the votes, are you proud of what you've done? Could you have done anything more? And try and remember that bit. That's the, that's the bit. Could we have done anything more? Make sure your people know that. Um, because sometimes the, the voters are you know, awkward people and don't do the things they should do. But if you can sit there when polls are closed and say, we did everything we could, we're proud of what we've done, that is the most important thing you can have at the campaign as a campaign manager. And that's something to think about mm. in the campaigning process as mm. well. I mean, there are a number of times when you, you know, you just want to go home or you want to give people the weekend mm. off and you want to, you want to care for them and as humans as they are. But at the end of the day, if you can look back and say, oh, we could have worked weekends earlier, or we could have, we could have done something, like you need to just put it all out on the line so that you can look back and say that you you really did it all. And that's something to keep in your mind as you're campaigning through the hard days and the crazy stuff that you have to do is just, yeah, at the end of the day, if you can look back and say, I did everything I could. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a, a great note to end this first part uh, of the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to see uh, whether there are any um, participants in the room who already have questions for our panelists. I can see some classmates here who, who are either um, thinking about their own run for office or who have already run for office. So I'd be keen to hear from them in particular. I think we have a first question over here. Could you tell us your name and uh, what you study or what you do? Hi, my name is Ali uh, Pasha. I'm studying foreign policy, uh, particularly nuclear weapons in South Asia. Not a student of blow battling, but I come here a lot. Uh, thank you, everyone, for speaking. Thank you for BSG for explaining this. Uh, so since we're talking about communication strategies, my question is about miscommunication, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the use of social media for of creating fake news. And we see this in national campaigns, but we're also seeing it in student campaigns like the Oxford Union election that is happening today. And we see this in campaigns all the time. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any experiences dealing with that and whether you think this is a problem that we can solve in the coming future or if this is just going to continue because people use it to promote toxic politics and divisive practices. So just wanted to hear some opinions on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, is there anyone else who has a question at this point? Yes, at the back. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Abdullah Khalayla. I'm not a student here, my wife is, but I work in education policy in Jordan. And um, one of the 
things that you brought up is whether or not uh, the population is, is ready for a message. So you're talking about the examples, are, are they ready to hear that uh, a foreign power might have had it affected uh, the election? Um, my question is, have you had experience getting people ready for some kind of message that you're going to mm -hmm. deliver? Is there some kind of build up or, or and how have you done that in the past? I think there was, yes, another question here. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, my question is re regarding uh, running against someone or maybe a cause that uh, might have a lot of foibles and yet those seem kind of to roll right off their back. So I'm thinking specifically of Donald Trump, so Kate, you might be able to address this, where um, he has scandals that follow him everywhere, and yet he seems a little bit impervious to um, defeat. And similar with Boris Johnson, you know, <laughs> multiple uh, individuals who, who just don't seem to be dragged down the way that other individuals are. And I'm curious how you build a campaign or a communication strategy against something that difficult to defeat. So three fantastic questions. Uh, so the first was about um, addressing miscommunication and specifically this phenomenon of fake news. Um, would anyone on the panel particularly like to take I this can, point? I um, can put my tuppence worth in. I think it's really interesting. I think um, there's so many questions even about what exactly is fake news. Is it something driven by a bot in Russia? Or is it something which someone has just started a rumor on um, Facebook, Twitter, and that's become gain currency and started to be adopted. That question has still to be answered. Now I know in Westminster at the moment and Whitehall, they're trying to figure out how to deal with fake news because it's a real issue for for large news corporates. It's a real issue for Facebook and Google. And they're trying to figure out who is exactly responsible for regulating news. And it's looking like it's going to fall to Facebook and Google. But how exactly that works is really, really unclear because it has massive implications on a lot of um, smaller news providers who actually rely on Facebook and Google in order to survive. Um, so there's, there was something called the Cairn Cross, Cross Review, which reported, I think, in February or March, uh, which set out some initial ideas for dealing with this, including kind of new forms of regulation. Um, but um, it, there's so many um, conflicting views from different parts of the digital and news um, and communication space as to how this should be played out, because every single form of regulation impacts someone in some way. So in a sense, it's a spaghetti junction of issues um, that's going to take a while for people to sort out. I think what... What does, what is positive is that um, the digital platforms are more aware of how this happens and more aware of their responsibility and are willing to take action in order to sort it out. So I think you will see the other side of it, I, I should add, is um, users becoming more savvy about what is fake and what isn't. But I still think that's impossible to tell some, to some degree because some fake news propagators are so sophisticated that it's very, if, if you're of a particular mindset and inclined to believe something, you're going to read it and see it as as the truth. So I think it's a very, very interesting and still unanswered question. So just watch this space, I suppose, in some respects. One quick thing to say on that. Um, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. But um, I think my journalist friends would be mad if I didn't say this. But I think the term fake news in itself is really problematic. Um, so from a journalist perspective, news is something that has already met a certain standard to be news. It's been verified. It has been well sourced. It has been fact-checked. It has been all the things to make sure that it is true before it can be published in a news source. And so when someone like Donald Trump uses the term fake news, which we have all followed and adopted, what he is saying is that news itself can be fake. Something the New York Times publishes can be fake. Um, and so I think what we're talking about is not fake news. It's misinformation, which is, has the intent to be false and be spread, and disinformation, which is people um, you know, falling for it and spreading it themselves. So that's just a, a quick point. But I think from a campaign perspective, yeah, we're up against kind of you know, crazy things, um, people, people, you know, the filter bubbles they live in and people wanting to read things that are scandalous and wanting to read things that, that they would like to be true, like you know, Pope Francis endorsed Trump. That's great. But um, I think you just, from a campaign perspective, you've got to be better, and you've got to have, you got to have messages. And no matter what is happening, the, f the worst thing you can do is draw a lot of attention to the, quote, fake news stories, because that just gives them more legs and, and more insanity um, and lets them run even further and, and just creates more kind of uh, space around that. 
Um, so you got to still stick to your message, and it's just got to be be better and stronger, and um, you know, laser focus on what you're trying to do, um, and then hope that we can sort out the regulation problems around it. But it's just a it's a new frontier. Mm -hmm. Just sort of add, I mean, um, obviously social media is a, a lot of this, but um, like the BBC during the, two, during the referendum campaign, uh, every night would report, uh, and today the Leave, the Leave campaign said, we will spend an extra £350 million on the NHS, which said had been completely disproved, um, complete nonsense, but it was reporting in terms of balance. And, you know, how are people supposed to work out? You know, when I heard it on the news, even a, re you know, a reputable news source, and I think that there is a massive issue now in politics where there isn't really a referee. And it's possibly it's impossible to referee as well with all the different formats and all the different channels. And from our point of view at the moment, the best we can do is use our networks to get the word out as quickly as you can back to that really sort of fast response type thing um, and make sure that at least your, your own people out there are spreading the, the, the right word to, to people. That, but that doesn't get everywhere and people will tend to believe anything that reinforces their own worldview and back to those bubbles. It's, it's a very, it's a, it's a weird world and there's not an answer to this at the moment, I have to say. I think sadly it goes back to the point that mm. the more money and the more resources you have, the more dominance you can have over the online space, which is a shame for... Yeah. Any party that's not the Tory party, for example, uh, in politics. So. Yeah, I want to say, so on, on the, the things falling aside, so we had um, a name for Trump, which was Teflon Trump in the campaign, because seriously, right, it was just anything that you lobbed at him that was, would sink any other campaign, it just rolled off his back. Um, I don't necessarily think it is, it is something that's inherent to him. I think he's actually, he and people like him are really strategic in how they make that happen. Um, so, so A, getting all the benefits from the spotlight and the increased kind of media pressure for his name and things like that. I think part of the reason why Trump became so big is because everybody was talking about his scandals all the time. And it's just his name out there, his name out there in a presidential way he was getting so much more media coverage than we ever were giving policy speeches or things like that, right? So, so there was a, a way to kind of um, capture the attention because of that. But then, obviously, uh, really quickly pivot. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't necessarily deny those things. He just uses that spotlight and goes and talks about what he wanted to talk about. So I think um, there's there's a nefarious strategy around that kind of thing. And then from the other perspective, um, I think. We on the campaign were dealing with the opposite, right? Of like any any possible element of of stink would stick to Secretary Clinton, whether it was completely um, misinformation, fake news, or not. It would it would kind of stick there, and I think that's just something that was a really off balance thing, and it really comes back honestly to the press and how the press is is um, giving you know feeding fuel to these fires and things like that. So you have to. You have to constantly, as a press team and as a communications team, be working through those problems. And it, it, you might be the lucky one where the press doesn't want to report on any of the things that are being locked up for you, and like that's great. Good for you. Uh, keep that up. If you're on the other side, you need to constantly, rapidly be after the press for this is not fair. This is imbalanced. This is, um, this is not how you would report on him, and, and try to hold them accountable in that way too, because that's a big part of what the communications team does. I would say that I think this is a demonstration that personality politics is still really really, really important, yeah, in, yeah. even in a kind of social media age. I think the thing with Boris Johnson is he's got this uh, persona, real or not, that he's this kind of charming, kind of scruffy, kind of bit of a buffoon, but, you know, he's flawed, and that's part of who he presents himself to be. Um, and I think that... Um, another candidate who doesn't have that same kind of persona, it's much more important for them to be kind of, you know, cleaner than clean, to not have any skeletons in their closet. What I would ask is this, um, is it really, really important to, for your candidate to be scandal free, or is this the perception that we have that, that candidates should be scandal free? And I think quite often, if there is a scandal come up, it's using it as an excuse, and it's, sometimes it's not the real reason why someone falls in, in popularity. Mm -hmm. I think that since... Um, the Back to Basics, I don't know whether anyone will remember this, but in the 1990s, John Major's government had this Back to Basis, Basics, basics um, campaign where it was all about morality. I don't think it was actually about morality, but it, got, it was perceived to be about morality. And then the press had a field day unearthing all these affairs and so on and so forth, and that kind of really um, hastened the decline of the party's popularity. Um, but actually, I think we now perceive... Um, morality to be a key integral part to um, a candidate's popularity, but I don't necessarily think that's 
the case. I think that's just a construct in our kind of political brains. We had another great question at the back about um, preparing, I suppose, an electorate for a difficult political message. Was that the essence of your question? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, getting people ready. I don't know, because on the one hand, I think a communications professional would definitely know how to approach that, right? It would be a month long lead up to some kind of, of uh, you know, bombshell like that, where there would be uh, little things drip, drip, dripping, getting it into the bloodstream, getting people understanding it. Um, there would be a full court kind of, um, in, in the campaign world, world, they call them surrogates. So people that are not the candidate or, or not the person, the, the leader, but people that can speak for them all on the same message and, and getting ready for that. So it would be something that's carefully choreographed and constructed um, for the purpose of readying the electorate to, to hear something like that. And I think, um, actually, if you think back to the campaign, that's why the Obama administration was really hesitant um, to put out any of the, the intelligence around what, what the FBI and CIA knew was kind of happening, because from their perspective, it would not have gone over um, the way that they intended to, and it would look very political, and it would look like he was putting um, you know, their, their hands on the scales. Um, so from a communications perspective, they would want that to be a long, well-planned out strategy. I think um, from our perspective and for, for other issues that are just real world, you don't have that time and you don't have the ability to plan that out. And so I think that's where the, the press relationships become really important because if you, if you are lucky enough to have built up a lot of credibility with, with the press where they trust you, where they know that you're generally not trying to spin them or they can, they can kind of see through what is spin and what's not, um, then they are more likely to kind of carry your water for you, which is what you ultimately want the press to do. Um, if they are, they are going to perceive everything you say through the lens of, uh, you know, this is spin or this is campaign spin, which is ultimately like what happened when we, when we started pointing the, the finger at Russia. Um, I remember that Sunday after the, the story I told you about, my boss was on uh, Jake Tapper on CNN and kind of said, you know, people are telling us it's Russia, which again, probably wasn't the way that should have happened, but that's what, that's what happened. Um, and, you know, Jake Tapper was kind of just incredulous, like, what are you talking about? Um, and immediately did not believe that. Um, so you got to, in the moment, find a short-term strategy to, to make it work, you know, use the press that you trust the most to get it out there first. Um, but hopefully you have a bit more time to lead up to that, and I think you, that can make it a lot easier. Yeah. Right, just on the, the uh, Teflon candidates, um, I think you always have to sort of separate it. If they're a Teflon candidate who are on 60% of the vote, then you've got a real problem because you've got to separate off, you know, you've got to, you have to make something stick. But often these, you know, the Trumps, the Boris Johnsons, there's actually very often an equal size group and often bigger group that's against them. And I think we get very sucked into worrying about what their supporters are thinking because, and, and you know, almost like trying to change their minds, which we're just not. Definitely. And it's just kind of like focus on all the votes that are open to you because that, that's, that, you know, you know, very often there are enough folks there to do that. And, you know, if Boris Johnson right, becomes prime minister, yes, the there's, a, there's one a third of the country probably go, oh, my goodness, this is the most best thing ever. But two thirds of the country probably going to go, my goodness, this is someone to stop. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's very powerful from, from, that, from that side. Um, and um, I mean, I think just on the getting people ready for a tough thing, it, it's always about, you know, if you can get people thinking about the problem, then, you know, and get people angry and ex exercised about the problem, then you can bring a, bring a solution to it. But, you know, it's when a problem comes from nowhere, that's when people just really get kind of a bit like, you know, mm. if this was a problem, why didn't you do something about it before? Because then you're laying the ground. You know, we took over a local authority uh, a few years ago and, you know, like financial problems you, you discover, and we were just dripping out week after week, oh, new financial scandal uncovered, no black hole in finances, because we knew we were going to have to raise taxes um, at the end of it. And, you know, when you do that, you've laid the ground, and then you can take people with you through difficult things if you've got them to sort of understand the extent of the problem in the first place. And, you know, that probably applies onto things like climate change. If people really get to understand the extent of the problem, then they'll be more willing to accept potential sacrifices that follow it. But if you don't do that first bit, you've got no chance of getting the second bit. So um, three great uh, questions to open the discussion. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to ask our, our panelists a question? Uh, there's a question over there. Hi, uh, I'm doing a PhD in politics here. Um, What's your uh, name, please? Uh, Alejandro. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> um, 
I was wondering if you can give any insights or if you have any experience of campaigning and uh, how do you call it, capturing hearts and minds in places where political clientelism has become part of normal mm. politics and campaigning. Clientelism, is that what you said? Yeah. We had a question here. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, my name is Erdem from Thailand and I'm studying here. So, thank you for being here today. So my question is about headlines. I think it's very important, especially nowadays in newspaper, on Facebook, when you have to read it before you have to click read more. So most of the people are going to read, focus on the headlines. So my question would be two part. So first, how do you guide your, your, your story or your statement to make the headline on your side? And second, if it come uh, opposite your side, like they are criticizing you, for example, if I say something now and the headline could be, I was fiercely said something or upsetly said something. So how would you deal with that news, that kind of headline that is overstated to misguide the reader? Any more questions? So yes, our mic holder himself <laughs> has a question. Antonio? Uh, my name is Antonio. I'm an MPP student here at Labatnik. My question is, is Facebook fading out as a uh, tool for campaign, and is WhatsApp the future of campaigning or not? Yeah. Okay, so our first question was about campaigning in an environment where political clientelism is the order of the day. So perhaps what I suppose you were getting at was that the, the substance of policy isn't necessarily what wins the day, but rather the promise of favors after an election. Or that uh, people are actually getting things, not necessarily money. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're getting, I don't know, books, uh, something to do their houses, uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've, um, uh, we have a sister party, a Liberal Democrats have a sister party in the Seychelles. Uh, so I've been fortunate enough to do uh, three uh, national elections in the Seychelles, which is obviously. I mean, this be really clear, it's the same laptop as I have at home, it's the same crappy building, that we're really kind of like, just that there is a paradise down the road that you can't visit for more than like three hours a week, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but um, out there, it had been a dictatorship uh, for like 20 years. Uh, they had opened up elections, but the kind of elections that were being fought were, you know, it was the government, governing party that had been that dictatorship were still in power. And uh, they had this wonderful thing called a calling off period before the election, for election day. So all the campaigning would have to stop five days out and you built up all this wonderful momentum as an opposition and then all the campaigning would stop. A ship would come into the harbour and on that ship were basically all the bribes that the government was going to hand out in the last five days of the campaign. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, as pretty scary to actually have to, to do this. And, you know, it's, you know, someone was out there several times, you know, we, they put us in, you know, basically public places um, when it got to election day because they didn't know if the, if the government lost, the, the army might have just moved in and just said, that didn't happen. And people that campaign in those environments um, and the oppositions are remarkable people, I can just say that. And, you know, working with them is, you know, it's the greatest honour that you, these people put things at risk that in most places that we, we just don't kind of get. Um, but in terms of like how we approach that, that and you know, yeah, when you go through that once, twice, three times, and each time where we, you feel like you're getting there, and it, then they cheat at the end and they pull it back, you know, it, you kind of just have to get um, smarter and more. Well, I say smarter, just more ambitious. That what was there, uh, and what they, you know, I think we're now the biggest party in the parliament, although we had not won a presidential yet. Kind of always support them if they get the bribes, uh, and actually, has uh, actually started to target the people that have been with the government for all those years. And at the very least, they might have to spread their bribes a little bit wider, uh, and might have to bribe more people to try and win, and really try and make sure that you know when we get to that calling off period, which is just the killer for any kind of opposition challenger party, when you build up that excitement and it just stops. You know that actually we're just further ahead, and you've really kind of like broken into you know some of those groups of voters that you know normally we wouldn't like you know the campaign. We think we don't need them to win. We just need to win it 
bigger in a place like that. And I think that's the approach they've, they've kind of taken. Uh, and doing a lot more earlier in the kind of campaign, way before the campaign, uh, to try and build the relationships with, with people that, you know, actually, I mean, fear is still behind some of the votes there. And you really have to take people on the journey to make them feel safe in what they do. Talk about lots of stuff around it. It's a secret ballot. The government can't know how you vote. Um, but, you know, it, it's a, it's a you know, coming, coming from, like, you know, a Western democracy where you kind of feel safe uh, in doing what we do, by and large, um, that is, is, is quite, a, quite a different environment. And, you know, anyone who fights in that, I just, you know, I can't say enough about them. They're brilliant people. I also think that there might be uh, people in the room who have direct experience of these campaigns, and it would be interesting also to hear your own perspective um, on uh, campaigning in these contexts. Um, Earth's question was about um, how you guide the headlines. Um, as a communications expert, Isabella, how do you, uh, how do you uh, influence what, what makes the headlines in newspapers or in the press? Well, I think it's just understanding what your target audience is, understanding kind of which it, it really depends on which oh my, sorry that's my mic um, which um, newspapers you're targeting what their audience is how to get kind of um, into the, into um, it's again it's a, it's a bit like clickbait and it's a bit like what's going to sell those papers but it's understanding what messages resonate with say for example it's um, it's an old cliche about the regions of the sun kind of what's important what's important to them I, a lot of the time it's really difficult to do and that's what you're saying really really cuts cuts through to that and again it's being simplistic um but it's looking um as sean alluded to just being aware about which, which audience you're you're trying to win you know, are you trying to win over the regions of the sun if so, you kind of look at your policy set and you target your policy set towards achieving that. Um, but if, if, they're not really, if you're really not going to win over them, you, can, you ha kind of have to be looking at different audiences elsewhere. And I think, again, it goes back to creating those very, very simple overarching policies which guide your campaign and really not trying to get too complicated or to have too many different stories because it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve those headlines. Mm. Um, when it comes to addressing headlines that are kind of anti-you, again, it, this goes back to issues communications and, and being prepared. Um, unfortunately, if there's a headline on the paper that's kind of critiquing you, you've kind of already lost control of the story a little bit, um, and that's going to be an issue. And the only thing you can do is uh, really throw all your weight behind uh, trying to trying to address, address that, whether that's a retraction, whether that's a denial, whether that's uh, this is completely wrong and I've got an interview on Newsnight that's going to tell you what the real story is. That's not always going to be possible. So I think actually your work has to start way, way, way beyond before you get that negative headline pops up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we had one last question, uh, which I personally... In, in, in my past life before coming uh, to the school, I worked um, as a diplomat, and it was said, you know, in the, in the corridor. Mm. Um, so I'd really like to know uh, what do you think about this, and whether you think uh, WhatsApp is. And this is this is not based on any expertise. This is just based on our parents and and their grandparents who want to see faces of their grandkids. I, I'm pretty certain the younger generation have, have barely even read, signed up for very different, different um, campaigning tool to, to Facebook. Um, so, but, but it is now to what it was you know, three, three or four years ago even. What Facebook is interesting in doing, though, is... Um, Talk a bit more about that. And that's kind of quite an interesting power that Facebook has. But what's, what's going to happen in the future is I'm not quite certain. I think from a tool perspective, though, they're, completely, they're for completely different purposes. So Facebook is, to the extent that people are still on it or, or what have you, that's where people go to get news now. So that's where they all see their commitments to vote and that kind of thing. It's another thing if you can text them an individual message that they're definitely going to get, they're probably going to respond to, um, and might you know, come at as incredible and, and made this app for us that we could then deploy for our volunteers. So instead of text in a couple hours, and it's fun, they can like,
have a party around it and um, everybody get together and if, or the way we interpreted the laws is for, they would block a big mass text so it can't be done in that way and I don't think and then the fun thing is that person can respond to you and be like oh that's great I'm gonna bring that was extremely effective, and and to that end, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think I'll just sort of um, clearly they list of like everyone's mobile phone number on the island, and you're like, how we? You always have to be very careful about. But I think the thing I'd kind of say is. And along came radio, and along came TV, and along came the internet. Now, Facebook's dead. Email's dead. It never is. And, um, so we've, we've got this, some, some great research that came, came to us that says no one writes letters to the internet. Um, and I think with all this, it, yes, we, you know, all don't shut down. And actually, you need to be very strong across all the and you know, going back to the Obama campaign in 2008, which was like when this was really coming up, incredibly powerful. Um, so um, yeah, I always have that sort of slight caution. It's kind of where we go fishing. We get a mobile phone number. You can build a stronger relationship, but it's a very good place to start with. You know. Um, and you know, even when we haven't got a database covering all some of those parts, and. Um, plays back to my earlier point about Twitter, which mm. when I read reports about Twitter, I heard a rumour that X, Y, Z is happening, when actually I've just read it on Twitter. Yeah. Um, the political journalists, and if you get inside it and you have, a, you can put your opinion across, it gives you a voice in a relatively in uh, the breakout sessions that are going to take place um, in, uh, between uh, the, uh, hearing from people who have worked for social media campaigns um, or another breakout session on uh, innovation and polling and using I worked on this and who are here to share their expertise with us uh, but had a fascinating discussion that has touched upon um, fake news, uh, the use of social media. Fantastic panelists.